Hello and welcome to Comic Book Herald's Creanitators. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. I am joined today for an interview with Jeff Smith. You may know Jeff as the creator of Bone, one of my favorite comics of all time, Razzle, Shazam, and the Monster Society of Evil, and of course, going on right now, Tuki. We got book one, Fight for Fire. We got book two, Fight for Family, and we're going to talk about those as well as Jeff's illustrious comics career. The latest release, Tuki, set two million years ago exploring the evolution of humanity in prehistory with a cast of multiple species of humans, saber-toothed cats, and a rich spiritual world of mystery. The softcover and hardcovers have been kickstarted and are, at least book one, is available for pre-order currently. I'm sure book two will be there shortly if you go to boneville.com and we'll include links to all that fun stuff in the show notes. Jeff, thanks so much for joining. Tukey started as a webcomic. And then for these Kickstarter volumes, you've been going back and restructuring for print. A lot of new pages, scenes and such. Um, it's interesting to me hearing how you've talked about this. You know, you're kind of remixing the story for a more complete, cohesive whole. Mm. Is this the most you've edited your own work? And have you enjoyed the process of like remixing yourself? Uh, I have enjoyed the process of, of remixing myself. And <clears throat> no, I've always done that. Um, I was just speaking with someone t this morning who was asking about the, the difference between the comics, the black and white comics, and the Scholastic color books. And there's, if you just read the comic books, the actual floppies that I released in the 90s, um, yeah, there's a big difference. Because as I would collect maybe five or six of them together, I would edit them and add to them uh, and, and make them better stories. Because I would have gotten feedback from you know readers and friends saying, oh, I didn't quite get that. So I'd go, oh, I can fix that. So... Um, but there really is no difference between like the black and white big one volume edition and the color books because by then, by the time Scholastic wanted to do the color series uh, for for graphics, I had pretty much finalized you know the canon of Bone in the big one volume. Uh, but so right. and I did a lot of I did a lot of remixing, so I love it. Let, let me ask here, if I, if I can frame it this way, because, yeah, I do want to hear about it. So with Tuki, you had, you know, because it came out as a webcomic first, there was sort of a, and I think you described it this way as well, more of that sort of Sunday newspaper strip, you know, thing, which is which is a, a big influence you've talked about in your own career, right? Works like I actually picked up um, Walt Kelly's Pogo for the first time in advance of this, uh, which that was fun to go and explore a bit. I never really read any of those. Um, but seeing kind of those influences, Peanuts certainly is one you've talked mm. about. Do you... You had that style and that kind of approach with Tuki. What was it that made you want to sort of shift it for these for these you know longer form um, you know lands? They're still landscape style uh, graphic novels, but but more of a cohesive story. Like, why did you kind of want to get away from the comic strip where it originated? Did you feel like that didn't work? I guess narratively in the way you intended. Yes, I felt like it didn't work, and I didn't know that until uh, we tried. We started to collect the uh, web comics for for a comic book. So we did like four issues of Tuki as a print comic book. And um, so there were two problems. One was they were landscape. So I couldn't print them. They, they printed sideways in the comics. So you had to read it like a calendar. Uh, and that bothered a lot yeah. of people, but it didn't bother me. I didn't care about that. I thought that was kind of cool and weird. Um, but what did bother me is when I read them that way, you're not switching to a new page. There was There's no... There's no break between you were reading it. It should flow like a book, and it didn't. Um, it mm. it read like a collection of you know Sunday pages that were meant to be read a week of, you know a week apart, and I just felt that that wasn't that good. And I also had some, some yeah. new ideas for the story, so I thought you know what let's just you know let's just put this let's just stop and rethink about this for a minute. And I had a blast. I had a blast because rethinking it is, it's a lot of fun because there's no pressure at this point. I've already done the comic, uh, whether I liked it or not. Now I'm, now I'm just improving it. And it's kind of fun to fill in those little gaps and uh, tweak little things and make it better. It's, you can see it happen. Sure, sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. That's cool. You talked about with Bone, you know, you kind of had the ending first. It was one of the first things you did and you knew where you were going to go the whole time. I've gotten the sense um, from listening to you talk about Tuki and even just here that like there are things that are happening in the story where it's maybe more, a little more organic, right? Like the introduction of the children, it sounds like really opened your eyes to like, oh, this is a story of found family, right? Yeah. And, and there's more going on here that you want to tap into and really flesh out and explore. 
do you now that you have two books down do you have a destination in mind now or are you continuing to keep it sort of organic and letting it see where it takes you i well i have a couple of similar to bone i do have an ending in mind uh and i have uh one or two tent poles that i want to hit on uh it's not bone was a little further along because i had worked on it for like four years uh and it, developed a story and then spent, you know, I forget what, another 10 years or eight years or something kind of putting it together. So um, I guess I have kind of spent like eight years working on Tukey now at this point. Um, but yeah, no, it's a little looser. I'm, 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 it's, I'm, for me, it's, it's a, it's a little scarier, but I, it's kind of more fun too, but I still do know the ending. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. I, I've seen you mention before that you had a six book plan for Tukey potentially. We got two now. Is that right still? Or, or kind of where are you, where are you picture and take it? As of now, that could, I mean, it could always change. That could be, I, I shortened bone by at least a book, if not two. Um, I had hmm. a, a, there was like a, there was a one last final act where I don't need to explain it, but I, I realized I don't need that. Let's just stop right there. Hmm. Uh, so but right now, that's the plan, six books. It just depends on how long it takes to actually fulfill some of the goals of the story. How many How many times a month does Scholastic email asking for the lost final chapter that you just mentioned, the lost final <laughs> act of Bone? They might not know about it. I kind of just tell, told you about it. <laughs> okay, we'll keep it on the download then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me. We'll keep it secret. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So with your last couple projects... You know, there's a clear path of of your personal interest in certain topics leading to boatloads of research and then leading to comics, right? And then leading to really cool stories. With Razzle, it's Tesla and, and string theory and parallel universes. And here with Tukey, it's paleoanthropology, evolution, dawn of humanity stuff. Um, what topics are firing your imagination lately? Is there anything else that you've been digging into that that could, you know, sort of be the next cycle of what you're working on? Uh, not yet, but it will usually before I finish a project, the next thing starts to bubble up. Yeah, yeah. Um, the trigger for this was, uh, if you read the back matter, in, uh, you, you, you probably haven't seen the second book here. I just have, I have a digital uh, preview of Fight okay. for Family. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, in the back, I do talk about, uh, in 1995, I went to Kenya and Tanzania with... Uh, Larry Martyr, who was the Tales of the Bean World cartoonist, and also ran Image Comics for a long period in the 90s. Um, and his wife worked with Abercrombie and Kent, the, the travel agency. And she was nuts about the parks and the animals. The elephants were the joy of her life. So we went to Kenya and Tanzania, but as we were out in the parks, there's a point where you cross from the Serengeti to the Tarangiri. And you, it, there's a place called Olduvai Gorge. That's where the, the famous archaeological site where all the fossils were found that go back millions of years, uh, different human species, all in the same spot, going deeper and deeper down. The roots of our kind go way back in Africa. And we went there. And I was always interested, even from the time I was a kid, in evolution. But standing there, right there, I actually had a vision like in, in my imagination, I was looking up at the ridge above the, the site, and I could see some, some trees swaying there. And I saw like all these different um, different kinds of humans, anything from the little tiny uh, Australopithecines to the Homo habilis, Homo erectus, the, the, the great fire starter. And I just really was moved by that. They were almost like walking around as if they were like in a marketplace, or you know, maybe they're maybe it's a tool factory or something, you know, stone tool carving. And I, and yeah. it, it, it just sat in my mind for a while until that finally, uh, until something finally kicked in and made me want to do the story. Sure. Sure. No, that's pretty cool. It, we're seeing, Tukey's really interesting because you're playing with this period of human history that I think is, at least in my education and my own limited knowledge is very misunderstood is verily uh, ill-defined. I think, you know, these, the idea of the evolution of humanity, but also that, you know, we were potentially, there were different species of humans interacting at the same time is definitely something I had not spent a lot of time thinking about or digging into. And I was excited to do so while reading this very fun comic. We're seeing 
renewed interest in banning comics these days. And mm. I, that's something you've seen before, oddly enough, with Bone, which like boggles my mind. I'd imagine Tukey can become a target amongst the more fundamentalist religious portrayals that that tend to react negatively to tales of evolution. What's your reaction when you see these movements to keep ideas, perspectives, science in some cases away from readers? Because you've seen it, you know, more than once. They're disgusting. They're so they're yeah. so blatantly anti-American. I mean, it's one thing if you want you don't want your kid to read something, and you don't want to read something. But what in God's name feels American about not letting anybody read something? But, well, I, you, mm -hmm. your beliefs are not everybody's beliefs. This that's what this country is all about. I, I find it I find it terrifying. And I'll tell you what, evolution yeah. is a fact. It's not it's not a choice of like oh I I kind of don't want to believe in it, dude. Tough. It's it's bones <laughs> and rocks and dirt and genetics. It's it's real. It happened. And it makes a and this setting two million years ago. Yeah, a lot of people don't really know this. I mean, if you if you're into like you know reading about the archaeological finds and Lucy and all that stuff, you do know about it. Yeah. Um, we've we've often not been we've mixed we've existed at the same time with other uh, humans. Most recently with Neanderthals in um, in Europe. Uh, so it's this is this is a it's it's. A odd thing that we're the only species. There's whole books on that. How could we, how did we become the lone human species on Earth? Because there used to be just so many mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, anyone who burns books or bans books is not the good guy, and that's just a fact. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's well said. No, it's it's incredibly frustrating to see um, in any in any instance. But yeah, I, th I do think this history is. It's completely fascinating. It's it's not the same thing, but you know there might be some readers out there who have a similar journey to me. Where my I have young kids right now, and they are head over heels for dinosaurs. So I've gotten all this dinosaur history over the last five years or so that I never thought I'd be getting. Um, but one of the things that boggles my mind is just the millions of years ago that we're talking about with dinosaurs, and then the millions and millions of years gaps before you get to 2 million years ago yeah. for human history. Like that was definitely like just how much time there is. And just like, I don't know that alone. On the, yeah. On the you can't you, of time and sort of our own evolution. Oh, yeah. Man. You cannot, you cannot have, you can't do fiction stories with humans and dinosaurs. You can't have it. Even mm -hmm. 2 million years ago where, you know, the, for the very first time we're starting to control fire and eat for cooked food. Dinosaurs have been gone from this earth over 60 million years at that point. So yeah, there's a, the, the time and the two, gap between us and 2 million years ago is almost unthinkable, let alone 63 right. million years ago. It's crazy. I love those times. Right, that's, exactly. that's, that, now that's, that's exciting. That's interesting. Yeah, for sure. No, because it is like when you think of human history, it's like, oh, yeah, like you're talking about like the 1930s, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, something really long ago. And it's like, yeah, no, right, right. <laughs> like it runs back even more than that. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is which is pretty interesting to think about for sure. Very humbling, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, so with Tuki here, you've had you've had these successful Kickstarters. This is the first time you've kickstarted a project. Obviously, you know, you are a, a pioneer of self-publishing. You are familiar with getting your work out there, but sort of tapping into the ways comics uh, propagate and get to people now. What's been the most exciting part of of running these Kickstarter exper um, not experiments, uh, experiences for you? I think the most exciting thing was just it's such a direct uh, communication with readers because uh, we've always had you know there's always been a couple middle a couple middlemen you know there's there's the distributor and then there's the, the whoever's selling the books you know. Uh, and so there's there's like a, at least a couple steps. This is this is directly from my hand to uh, the reader, and the the communication was just phenomenal and the support. So I didn't know what people would think about uh, an old fucker like me making a new book. Does anybody care? I didn't know, um, and I or, or would they be interested in in this topic? I had no idea, but I got but I have mm -hmm. I have self publishing buddies from. Uh, back in the day, back when Bone was self-publishing, there was uh, the Politos who were doing the Lady Death books, and uh, Billy Tucci and his wife Deborah who were doing the were doing She, uh, and they were and they were doing Kickstarter, and they were saying you got to try this, and I was like really I, I don't is this really for me I don't know, and they said yeah, 
Kickstarter would love to see you. And they were right. I mean, the support was terrific. I mean, we had talked to um, Diamond and asked them, you know, like, you know, we usually, how many do you think, you know, because we've got to figure out how many to print, right? How, how many do you think will sell? Mm -hmm. And they're usually, it's really a lot. Well, it wasn't a lot for Tukey. They were like hardly any. Hmm. So um, then we went out to Kickstarter. We, we sold quite a few. So that was also a happy thing. Why do you think there was, at least from Diamond's perspective, a sense of not, there wasn't going to be as much interest because it was a repackaged thing from a webcomic? Do you think that was part of the, I don't know, some sort of negative perception there? Or what do you Possibly, think? Possibly, or it could have was? been, you know, Rassel was, was not a bone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. in terms of sales, I mean, I I quite pleased with it, but uh, yeah, I don't know that Russell knocked their socks off sales wise. So I I, I don't know. I actually don't know. Uh, but it was it was it was a much happier experience going over to Kickstarter. I'll tell you that. And we but we we love the retailers again. So we we made sure there was a retailer tier in there so that retailers could get it at the same price they would if they went through the distributor. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So I'm curious, like one thing that stands out to me in your comics career is you and, and Vijaya, your wife, um, with cartoon books, you're very intentional about intentional about paths forward for comics, you know, about finding new audiences. Um, and that's something that I've seen, you know, sort of studying just the history of Bone, right? And just getting it out there and finding people, connecting with retailers, all that fun stuff. Um, when Scholastic wanted to republish the books, you know, the colored collections that started in 2005, how, how much did you see the opportunity for graphic novels in the young readers market? Like, was that, I guess, kind of how intentional was that versus like, you know, now it would be like, well, if you're a big comic, you know, you'd come out via image or dark horse or one of these types. Like, why was it, why did Scholastic make more sense to you in that moment? <laughs> I mean, it was pretty obvious that that was going to be a big deal. I thought, uh, well, Vijay and I had been yeah. trying to, um, get some publisher, a uh, new York publisher to pick up, bone for a couple of years um i remember being out there uh, not long maybe a month after 9 11 um we we went around it's had nothing to, this has nothing to do with 9 11 i'm just remembering when it was we went uh around to the, to the new york uh publishing houses we visited scholastic even um no just no one was interested uh I mean, we got a little bit of interest from a couple um, big companies, Random House, I think. But they were more interested in like, well, could we, they were looking at it like it was a novelty, like maybe we should, make, like they were thinking of it almost like a pop-up book, I think would be a good way to put it. Or uh, they were like, well, what if we, you know, changed it so that there was like a page of text and a page of art? And I was just oh. like, that's a big little book. No, this is a graphic. This is a comic book. We're this is already. Yeah. And at that point, we were already like in. I can't remember. At that point, it had to be like in like 15, 20 languages all over the world. It was already known, and it was we were nearly done. I, I was close to finishing it. So we were trying to do this. So when Scholastic, on their own, called us. We were like, we went crazy. It was actually kind of a good story. It was like, uh, we, there's, only, there's only four of us. There's me and Vijay and there's two full-time employees, Kathleen and Tom. And, uh, well, we might've had, we might've had Steve then. Yeah, yeah, Steve was there too. Steve Hammaker who colored it. And anyway, one day, like Kathleen answered the phone and said, oh, Vijay, it's uh, for you, it's Scholastic. And so Vijay goes into her office and closes the door. And she's in there for a long time. And we all, like, like, in a, like in a TV show, we're all kind of listening to the door. And then Vijay opens it. We're all standing there. <laughs> but she says, we got to talk to these people. They get it. They totally get it. They didn't want to just make it. They didn't want to change it. They didn't want to do anything with it. They wanted to start a line of graphic novel imprints for young readers. It would be the first of its kind. And they wanted to launch it with Bone. And the, the key phrase that I remember hearing was, we're not going to shelve it with uh, the Dungeons and Dragons and all that other stuff. We're going to we're going to put it on the shelf right next to Harry Potter. <laughs> right. OK, yeah. yeah, that works for me. So, yeah, I knew I knew immediately that was going to be a game changer for sure. Sure. Well, and I think a lot of a lot of readers today 
might not recognize like because right now the the young readers market that the kids lit if you will is the biggest thing in comics i mean it's absolutely dominating the yeah. book market and i think it's it's easy to assume that that's always been the case because it makes sense, <laughs> you know, but yeah. when like this is literally the book that Scholastic launches their graphics line with right in 2005, like it's it's absolutely instrumental. Yeah, it was uh, it was it surprised all of us. It was uh, it was the first of the big mega million dollar selling graphic novels for the YA group. It. It, it, it caught up. It, it, I mean, everybody was really pleased, but we, we did. We, I don't think we were expecting it to be that big. And um, and of course, then we had uh, uh, Kazu Kibuishi and Raina Telgemeier, who is now like she's part of that same graphics imprint, but she's like she's knocking them out of the ballpark for sure, which makes me very happy. I, I love Raina. Yeah, no, I, I had the chance to talk to um Kazuki about Amulet, and like that's another one that's just it's killing it now. But it's definitely owes a, I think a, a a legacy, and I think he even referenced this. You know, it's a bone, right? As as inspiration at, at the time when you're when you're sort of making this transition, you had just finished Bone. I think probably the all in one volume. You know, is is you're putting that out, and you're seeing some success there, which which I love. I've had that for for years now. Did you? Was there any part of you that like? recoiled at all at the perception of bone as kids lit because that was not how that was not what you were creating right you were creating comics you weren't you weren't writing them for kids necessarily right you were just telling your story um right. but it, in the 90s right you're a part of a movement with the likes of like neil gaiman with sandman i know you've been yeah. inspired by like art spiegelman and mouse right these are the the serious if you will quote unquote right the serious graphic novels that sort of break down these barriers bone works in that vein but was there any part of you that was like this isn't for kids like this is this is Adult stuff. I don't know how did, how did that work for you. I, well, I I I did was I did think about it. Um, it I mean what, what for me Bone was uh, it was supposed to be a kids book for adults because there weren't too many kids reading comics in the early nineties. Um, and in fact, if when people started to in the comics press would refer to me as uh, as it as a kids book, I would fight against it because. There were no kid readers, so if yeah. I was perceived as a kid's book, uh, I, I would be—I'd be out of business. And nobody would—I would be in trouble because mm. retailers were like, "I don't have any kids shopping in here. I have, might have one or something." Yeah, so, sure. Um, so I mean, there's not—I never thought there was anything that kids couldn't read because my goal was to do Peanuts or Pogo. To, I would to be in the newspaper with Peanuts and Pogo. So Peanuts and Pogo yeah. were in there. But not everything in there. I mean, Dick Tracy was in there. Now, if you read Dick Tracy in the anytime, you know, collections from the 30s or 40s or 50s, good God, that was a that was a squeam. <laughs> you can be squeamish reading that thing. Uh, but that was my yeah. goal was to do something that could be in the newspaper, not necessarily worrying about saying fuck or something. But just I wouldn't say that. Right. I'd figure out a way not to say it if. Uh, if I was in the newspaper, so that, so that was so. There was nothing in there the kids couldn't see. I mean, of course, uh, the day we were going to sign the deal with Scholastic, they called us in. They asked us to come in early, and it was because uh, at the last minute, we had actually gone. Virginia and I had flown to New York to have a signing ceremony, um, and the whole day was you know planned. We were going to meet with different groups and uh, book fairs. Apparently, had a little freak out, um, and so the the publisher pulls the a stack of my, my self, our self-published books and sets them on the table. There's some post-it notes in there. And there's, I can see on the words on there, like uh, tobacco, uh, beer, um, the word G's. I, I had J E E Z sometimes that was flagged and there's all oh. that there. Huh. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the, and the, the publisher said, you know, are we, we, we Book fair just has a little bit of a problem with that, and you know, and I said, I, I see that I see the word beer there, and she said, well, and I said, well, she says, well, couldn't we change it to like you know, like in Harry Potter, they just call it butter beer. I said, yeah, well, this isn't Harry Potter, <laughs> and they and I said, the good <laughs> characters don't drink beer, Foam Bone and Thorn don't drink beer, and they were you know, and Smiley Bone has a cigar, like, but it's a vaudeville prop, it's it's a Groucho Marx cigar, um, and Vijay and I had agreed ahead of time. That if this is what this if this would ever would come up, we were gonna just thank them and, and leave. 
So we said that. I said, yeah. look, we, just, we, we didn't say it was a children's book. All the librarians said it was a children's book. Parents said it was a, light, a children's book. Parents and children all over the world said it was a children's book. I never said it was a children's book. And it's already done. It's already a children's book. It's all over the world. It's done. If it's, I'm not, we're not changing anything. She looked at us and she picked a book pile up, set it down on the floor. And she says, well, book fairs is just going to have to catch up. And mm -hmm. it, they did. They caught up pretty quick because they sold a ton of them. <laughs> Yeah, I think it worked work best for all parties. It, it, we actually had a question here from a, from a Twitter uh, fan. It said, it, from Licensed Chill, says, do fans bring up their experiences with Bone being directly tied to the book fairs a lot with you? Do you hear about that a, a bunch from different, like, new fans? Yeah, I do. Yes, I do. I mean, uh, it's been around for a long time, 30 years. So there are people mm -hmm. that, you know, got in on it when it was a little indie black and white book. Uh, just available at the comic shops. And there were people that first saw it in early 90s in Disney Adventures Digest. Um, and I have people come yeah. up to me all the time and said, I can't believe I didn't know it went past that. I just, I never knew what happened to it. And now I found the whole book. So, um, and yes, and of course, uh, the book fairs. Uh, of course, those first book fairs people are all in college now. Um, but yeah, but it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's right. crazy. It's crazy. It's, uh, it's, it's, we're on like the, at least the third generation by now. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and now, you know, you've kind of, you've kind of begun setting the stage now too, to like, you know, like I mentioned, I have these younger kids and they they can't read yet. So they're not quite of, of age with bone, but it's something I think about a lot. Like, Oh, seven, eight, when do I want to hand them the all in one volume? Um, but you have the actual, the, the actual literal kids book the picture book that you've done, the bone adventure yeah. too now where I can share that with them. Right. And get, and get the next generation. Did they, right? Have they seen it? For, what did for they reading think? Bone, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I actually just read it to them this week. Um, they had a really fun, so I have, I have a five-year-old, uh, a two and a half year old and a baby. Um, so the, so the baby had limited feedback, but <laughs> <laughs> the other two, um, the five-year-old, <laughs> the five-year-old in particular, um, he wanted to read it twice. He was like, again, like again, and I, you know, I do the same oh, good. Again, with, with phone great. bone and, and, and phony. Yeah, no, it's, it's the highest. It is the highest. That is a five-star review. I, I hope that, uh, yeah, that is a five-star <laughs> review. That's my favorite. Yeah. That's, um, I hope I'm not yeah. telling tales out of school, but Jed Winnick, um, you know who he is. He, um, yeah, his, his uh he had when his kid was a little toddler he read all of bone to him and when he was done mm -hmm. um oh wait i'm sorry i'm mixing up i'm mixing up my my books he read little mouse gets ready which was also an actual kids book that okay yeah and at the end of that there's yeah. like a little surprise a little explosion of surprise and he and apparently every time they read the book he did the same thing so he filmed it and he, the kid gets on the floor and he starts doing the curly shuffle on the floor going again, 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 squealing. <laughs> yeah. Five star review. That's so, and so those kind of so yeah, those stories, absolutely. these stories of people who tell me, you know, they've, they've read it and it's been with them, you know, their whole life and they take it with them to college and everything. That's, that's removed any possible qualm I ever had about it being a kid's book. It's never been to kids' book. I, I was one worry I had was that I would go to book signings and my grown up readers would be turned off by a line of moms and kids. But that wasn't true. That did not happen. The the the, I, the people still line up to get their books signed, but they're just mixed in. And they talk the grown ups, you know, talk to the they don't talk down to the kids, they just talk to them about the books and it's it's pretty awesome. It turned out really good. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really cool to, to see how this book's evolved. It, so you've, you've revisited Bone a handful of times since 2010. Um, Rose, Coda, these books. Do you find yourself writing or thinking about the franchise differently now that there is? You know, this this obviously, you know, your audience now has evolved, right? There's a generational aspect and a younger readers aspect. Um is there something there, like when you're writing a coda, that that wasn't necessarily the, there the first time? Uh, mm, no, not really. Uh, the, doing something like coda or the tall tales or just little short stories that I snuck in every now and then. The whole point of that is just I, I don't want to say goodbye to the bones. I but I don't really want to. I don't really want to do a sequel. I just don't. 
I just don't think I can top that. Now, that's a young man's game. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I am trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to play the game with Tukey, and I think I can. But to top, to top something like that that was lightning in the bottle, I think that would be a fool's mm. fool's errand for sure. Uh, well, I was going to just say when I did write Coda, it it's it just fell right into place for me, and there was nothing different. They're the same characters. They immediately came alive in my imagination and started arguing with each other, and it was making me laugh. So it was great. So we're we're doing a Tall Tales too, uh, which is the first one was Smiley Bone and Bartleby take some little Bone Scouts and they sit around a campfire and they tell stories, and I was I used that to get rid of a few orphan stories I had around, uh, and we wrote a couple new ones as well. Well, that's the same thing with Tall Tales too. Uh, we're going to color Coda and put it in there. Uh, there was another orphan story that Stan Sakai drew that was about this little riblet yeah. pig who just wrecks hack, havoc, havoc with uh, the two rat creatures. Yeah. So we're coloring that. We're going to put that in there. So uh, that's going to be fun. And I'm, in fact, today I am uh, drawing uh, the, the book ending, the framing pieces of uh, Smiley Bone and, and Bartleby, you know, setting up camp and getting ready to tell the stories around the fire. That's awesome. That's great to hear. I love uh, I love Usagi Ujimbo. And I, I actually, my library had a copy of the black and white um, Stupid Stupid Rat Creatures. So I picked that up this past week. And I, with the Stan Sakai story, I was like, no way. I had no idea he did something it's in the It's really universe. funny. So did that's, you, that's extremely exciting. Have you read that yet? Okay, I didn't write it. That was actually... Yeah, yeah. Riblet, Riblet is hysterical. It's hysterical. It's Tom Snagoski, who... Uh, writes a lot of things. He, he's a he's all over, he's everywhere. He writes Vampirella. Uh, he did he did Buffy and Angel and anyway, uh, it's very funny. He did a great job. And while we were coloring it, we 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 kept reading it while we were trying to color it and just cracking ourselves up. <laughs> That's awesome. So so Tall Tales Two is happening. Do you know when that is supposed to be out to the public? Uh, it'll probably be summer of 23. That's what okay. I'm saying. And I heard, I heard you say in an interview, I think it was on off panel with David Harper, that there were plans for a 30th anniversary bone all in one with the likes of Coda and um, these tall tales included. Are there still plans for that? Uh, no, they kind of fell by the wayside. We ran out of time. Uh, we had some idea, and maybe we might revisit it because we, we do talk about it every now and then for another anniversary, uh, maybe the 35th or something. Yeah, we were talking about like doing like three, I think three giant, maybe four giant books. So you'd have uh, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 of Bone, oversized, in color, uh, and have a fourth volume that would have Rose and Tall Tales and Stupid Rat Creatures and all that stuff, all the, all the bonus material. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it was it was too complicated, and we couldn't get it done in time for the thirtieth. So, but but one of the reasons we couldn't get it done is because I was like, I want to do Tukey for the thirtieth, and so that's what we did. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. No, I I actually had the experience. So I've I had Redbone obviously quite some time ago, um, and I loved it. And but I I had no idea there was more. You know, I just I had read the all in one edition. And I was like, I got it. I did bone. <laughs> I didn't know there were all these sort of, you know, uh, additional stories. So this past couple of weeks, as I've been getting ready for this interview, I was so delighted to see <laughs> that there were these tall tales and Coda and, and Rose and all these things. So that was a blast. Um, cool. So I, I do think a fourth, uh, yeah, a connected hardcover thing would like, I think fans would be excited about that. Um, it, it, should it, should an anniversary arise where that is, uh, is an appropriate, you know, step yeah. forward. But either the 30th, like, yeah, either 35th or like the 40th or something. Yeah, one big giant box sure. with like four oversized hardcovers in it. You'll have to take out a mortgage yeah, yeah. to get it. I don't know what it'll, <laughs> I don't know what it'll cost. So we'll probably have to take out a mortgage yeah. just to get it printed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, so it, it, one more Brown question here. It, you were working on the quest for the spark. You worked on the illustrations. These... these um, you know, young adult reader uh, novels. You mentioned you don't want to do a sequel. That kind of functions like a sequel. Um, I know. You know, it kind of functions like a postponed saga. Um, do you think that's like 
Like, is that kind of your bone too? Like, is that kind of the sequel? Mm, oh yeah, uh, well, no, I guess in a way it is because it is a it is a story that takes place a little later in the valley. But that's also why I don't want to do any more. Yeah. Right? That that's not. I didn't realize it would come out like that. I just thought. Well, I just love working yeah. with Tom Stagoski so much. I mean, we 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 make each other do crazier and crazier things that I don't think either of us would do on our own. Um, but I just figured, okay, well, I know how to protect it as long as. As long as the three bone cousins aren't in it, then it's okay. Yeah. But then ended up with like grandma and Thorne were in it, and there was a new kind of villain. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not saying there's anything mm-hmm. wrong with it. I, it was a good story. Uh, he, he really nails the, the rat creatures, he's got them down. He's really good at that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was a little too close to a sequel for me. And I said, I don't, I don't want to do any more of those. That's, that's too much. Too close. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. If readers haven't checked those out, they are very engaging. Um, so if you are looking for more returns to the Valley of sorts with, with a new crew, um, those are out there. All right. And, and we got to talk to as recently as late 2021, there's interviews of you um, talking with confidence about the, the Netflix animated bone. And obviously these past couple weeks, you've learned that they've decided to cancel, or we've learned that they've decided to cancel the series. It's, it's gutting for fans. I can only begin to imagine what it is for you having been through this for decades, as you put it in a comic strip, it's the Charlie Brown football being pulled away time and time again. How long have you known and, and what insight do you have into what happened there? Uh, it happened right before Christmas um, uh, last, last year. And um, <clears throat> yeah, they let the, they let the, the crew go. We had a very small crew. We only had, we only had like four people. We had uh, Kate Morris um, and Nick Cross, two incredibly talented genius people who uh have worked on shows like steven universe and adventure time and over the garden wall uh i was very lucky yeah. to get them um i think uh, i think i was i was i was kind of more crushed and upset for them i i part of me didn't part of me didn't really believe it was going to happen and i usually said in interviews even when i was confident because i had this great i had i had a dream team of uh, creators working on this. And they were really, they did a deep dive into bone. They could talk bone. We could talk, they could breathe it. They got it. And they were very carefully uh, structuring out maybe two seasons, uh, planning, it, planning it that way. Um, we had a lot of trouble from the beginning though. Uh, not, mm. not, our, not of our own making. Uh, the first was COVID. Uh, we announced at the end of 2019 that Netflix had purchased it, and then that, uh, and then nothing happens in Hollywood after Thanksgiving. That's it. Nothing happens till January. So in January, um, the producer Curtis Lee Lash and I. Curtis also had just come from Cartoon Network, where he was uh, also, you know, had a lot of great shows, including the one that most of the ones I just named. Um, to his credit. And he was a huge bone fan. So we were having fun just, you know, saying, Hey, what, so what kind of ideas, what anything goes, he had, he had been given uh, green light power. So we were like any, we were, anything goes, whatever we want, we could do. And I was very excited about the concept of doing it and episodically because the real problem with the movie studios, no, nobody set out, sets out to you know, buy a property and make, and screw it up. What happened was, is the executives were in this mindset where it had to be a 90 minute movie and it had to be the whole story that happened over and over and over again. Um, yeah. So it got, it got, it got shit canned a couple of times at Warner Brothers, but a new executive, new executives come in, get rid of it. The new next executive, but Warner Brothers bought the rights. So it was stuck there. Um, and the new executive would yeah. come in and they would love it and go, bring it back up. And just as we would get going, then they'd get a better job offer somewhere else and move. And then, uh, mm-hmm. so that was, that was 10 years. It was at Warner Brothers for 10 years. Um, and I don't know why they bought, I don't know why they bought the rights exactly. Um, they, they wanted to do something I didn't obviously, uh, cause they kind of cut me out of it. But the, but the point of that is that, um, once the, rever- once the rights re- did revert to me in 2018, Everything they had spent on it in ten years, I had to pay them back with compound interest, which 
was in the contract. You. I signed that deal, but it seemed so impossible that it, we weren't going to make something in 10 years, right? <laughs> and that yeah. would come back to me and I'd have yeah. to pay back everything we spent. In, uh, well, anyway, it did happen. And um, it was such nice. a miserable, it was a miserable experience. And Vijay and I were just like, let's not, let's not even tell people we got the rights back. But word spread fast. So we immediately started getting contacted by streaming, streaming networks and studios. And um, Netflix made the most sense because of Curtis. Uh, he really, he, he had a, he had quite a resume uh, and had this green light power. Let's go. So, and, he was able to convince Netflix to buy the lien off of Warner Brothers. So they took over the lien. So now the consequence is that now that they canceled it, they canceled it you know, last Christmas, but they still have the rights. So I don't, I haven't, I not, I didn't make any announcement. They didn't make any announcements. And, you know, I, I would just have to see, I don't know what, I don't know what the future holds. What a mess! What a what a tangled mess of, of rights and, and yeah, fortune so, there. Yeah, yeah, because it just it just makes so much sense. Yeah, so I mean, let let's talk about the the potential positive. I think um, not of this situation, but just of like of getting it animated. Like, what's the stuff that you're most excited about in terms of like your vision for what it could be? Like, what are the things that just get you, that had you so jazzed about what it could have been? I I can picture I can picture people falling in love with the characters again. It's happened over and over again. Yeah. In the comic book market, in the in the graphic novel market, in the children's YA market, it just happens over and over again. And I I thought uh, this could really be a big audience. And um, t- to be perfectly honest, I half of me was just as excited about the fact that I would sell out a lot more books. <laughs> as I was about the, yeah. the the movie, but the seeing it animated, I'm also excited about the things I couldn't do in the comic book, which are, you know, really show the environment, really, really spend a moment mm-hmm. to look at the clouds or um, water going over a, a little rock in a in a, in a stream. You know, bring the world to life. There would be birds and sound effects, and I imagine, in I imagine, there would be a lot of fun. You know, in the uh, in the recording studio, working with voice actors, and, and I, I I pictured there would be a lot of laughing. And I pictured there'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, just in the writers' room. Uh, unfortunately, we 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 started talking just without a crew in January and I was going to fly out there April 1st to start interviewing and trying to uh, find, you know, picking who we were going to have with staff. And the March 20th was COVID, the lockdown. So everything was canceled yeah. and um, we didn't know what was going on. And I, and I know that some studios were already, you know, well, you know, they were in their middle of production they were very resourceful and we were able to switch the zoom and somehow I don't know how they did it, but we didn't have anything. We didn't have a crew. We were started. So we, we lost, we lost most of that year. It was, we lost that whole year up until September uh, when we finally got Kat and Nick and just, I mean, we were, we still, we just were like, yeah, can't wait to get started. And then the huge uh, shuffle, uh, the big executive scramble at the top, a big shift, big, the biggest change I've seen in show business that was right over my head. That's not true. I have at mm-hmm. least two more, but I won't waste your time. <laughs> so, um, so it yeah. was never, it was never easy for us. We were, we were constantly, because then, because six months after that uh, executive um, shuffle, our guy, Curtis, couldn't, he couldn't, take it anymore and he had to leave so that was another major blow um so we 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 struggled we struggled on and i we were finally really starting to gel uh and when the news came that it was just over but they still have the rights so we're still waiting to see what where we're going from here okay yeah yeah do they give you any any insight at all as to the the rationale for it or you do you not get that sort of thing 
I was I was not told about the meeting. I was not invited to the meeting. Uh, all I but uh, on the Friday before the meeting on Tuesday, uh, Kat and Nick called and like we we got to put together a, a pitch because we 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 were under the impression we were didn't need to make a pitch. We thought we had a green light. We knew that there was a moment when we would get the green light, and we hadn't had that moment. But we didn't. Mm. Once Curtis, when Curtis left, they had taken away his green light power. So we got caught a little off guard by by that. And um, I, I, afterwards, I got the word, and I asked Cat. I was like, "Well, who who were the executives? Who was in the meeting?" She said, "I don't know." Uh, the Zoom meeting started. No introductions were made, and they said, "Go." And we had we had some inklings that they were like justify this. We were hearing things like you know justify this, explain what this is, why is this, what are some sales figures? We were some mighty impressive sales figures, but they didn't that didn't seem to make any difference. So we don't know. Yeah. I don't. I don't. We'll have to wait to hear from them, which we probably never will. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Yeah, well, that's too bad. So uh, I don't know how much you want to or can get into this, but it's stuck there until you get it. Is there some sort of out for you to, to get the rights or just that's a whole a whole web that you get that time? That is out? a that is an unknown at this point. Yeah, can't. And there's no use. No use stressing about it. Let's sure. Build. Right. OK. Oh, man. Yeah. Just sounds like kind of the so much so much potential and then so much just yeah just kind of like the, the pandemic obviously messed up a lot of well the world right <laughs> for yeah. starters um but just timelines yeah. and schedules and plans and all that stuff and then you get executive shifts and and not seeing your vision on top of that it sounds like kind of a perfect storm um it's of, always a perfect storm the project <laughs> i mean i i mean i'm not i'm, I'm not gonna get that I, I mean i don't know i'm not gonna get that mad at them they made their decision I've I've gone without I've gone without a movie for 25 years. If a couple more go by, it's not going to kill me. Well, I, I might die by then, but that's <laughs> then I really won't care. Then. Hopefully not. Yeah. <laughs> no, hopefully not. Um, yeah. No, it is. It, it's funny because like when I think about the adaptation, just on my own selfish fan level, you know, it's like, well, I don't need it. Like I've enjoyed the story. I've got it. Like I'm good. But then you think about just what what happens when these things get the visibility of a show or of a movie and how many more readers then come to the table um, and, and would get to enjoy bone in a way that they wouldn't, or in a way that they, they, whatever, they have their own baggage with graphic novels. They don't think they're, they're worth their time, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously it would have done something. Um, so yeah, no, it's too bad to, to see that not happen because it's, it's a book that deserves it, I think. And I, I think everyone who's read it agrees, you know? Well, the one silver lining was the, uh, reaction to the announcement i personally was very happy that it yeah. finally came out uh because i was having to play word games or not try not to talk about it or something or um or uh -huh. or try to look on the bright side and i i was not enjoying that so i'm i'm glad it happened but then to see like we, my wife and i got up oh my dog's running around with a squeaky toy um my wife and i got up friday morning and we're like hey look bones trending and we're like, oh, <laughs> but then it was like 70,000 tweets of people really shocked and yeah. not happy, very unhappy that it yeah. happened. And I mean, the story was not about bone. The story was about all the kids animation was being just shut, shut down. And uh, they had all sorts yeah. of, there's the executive shuffle. There was the stock drop. Um there was a subscriber loss. That was all. That was what the story it was. A, it was a big story about a lot of things, but man, most of the headlines and the images with those stories were about canceling Bone. I thought that was. Yeah. I thought that was a good sign. That um, I don't know. Maybe maybe they'll see that and rethink, or or maybe maybe there's just it, it proves that <laughs> people did want Bone. Who would want to see it? Yeah, Everybody. right. No. Yeah, no, everybody, everybody was gutted. I, I have not seen a single, oh, makes sense, reaction. <laughs> like, I have not seen the, a single fan who was like, hmm, yeah, you know, Bone, Bone didn't need in it. Like, everybody wants it. Everybody's excited. I don't know. I mean, there is, 
there is some precedent with them recognizing they canceled a thing too soon or whatever and and then doing it but obviously time will tell on that front so i mean i'm sorry to hear it for you for the team um but obviously fingers crossed that you can can find a resolution that works um because yeah i hope so i hope so i i just i'm I'm trying to keep my I'm trying to keep my myself occupied with Tukey. It's that's my real job and my real passion. So and and it's 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 doing pretty well. It's getting uh, it's getting very good reviews. Uh, we're actually it's actually just came out in December and it's, we're going back to press for a third printing. Um, and the second book is done. And like I said, we we must have sent you the digital copy, uh, and that will be in stores yeah. in July. So I'm actually I'm actually pretty occupied with Tukey. It's, it's exciting. So I'm, I'm worried about that. And if, Good. if, if things change for bone at Netflix, you know, I, I hope that I, I'm, I'm going to worry about Tukey for now. Yeah. How far along are you in the, the future of Tukey, like book three, book four, or like what's kind of the, do you have a timetable for when people can start to think about those? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Cause I, I have a, uh, tall tales too which is due to Scholastic uh, this summer. So I'm, I'm working on that. And then when that's in the can, I'll start on 2 key 3 Okay. Um, I'm assuming because there hasn't been uh, additional news too with Razzle, I know there was talk of movie status at one point with that. Is there any update there or anything that's going on with Razzle as far as a possible movie? No, not, not really. No, not really. Uh, it gets optioned pretty yeah. regularly, but... Nothing, nothing ever really happens. And a lot of Rassels kind of exploded into movies anyway. The multiverses. Um, everything's yeah. multiverses now. So I don't know if Rassel... I mean, Rassel, I felt, was pretty fresh and new when I did it. I didn't make up multiverses. They've been in Marvel and DC and Star Trek for decades. But I thought I came up with yeah. a pretty compelling multiverse plot. Uh but they, there's, there's so many multiverses now that I don't, I probably, I probably, nobody will probably do that. It'll feel like you're chasing a trend as opposed to. Yeah. The, I, yeah. The I mean, I felt like I was setting you know, a trend. Definitely not that. It. Yeah. But it's, I'm chasing it. It would be chasing it now. And I'm not that interested. In yeah. Chasing yeah. It, sure. For sure. No, I love Razzle. It's super fun. Is there, is there, have you ever considered a bone shared universe with Razzle and Tukey? Like, could these, could these all be connected through parallel universes in Razzle? Uh, maybe, maybe, oh, through parallel universes, huh? Well, yeah. My, well, my parallel universes weren't quite as far as, like, yeah, but yeah, I guess I could. I, shit, I never thought yeah. of that. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. All right, all right. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, do you know Terry Moore stuff? Strangers in yeah, Paradise. Yeah, there's a there's a Terry Moore uh, humble bundle going on right now that I was. Oh yeah, I bought. Even though I have great, all the comics, I, yeah. I bought the humble bundle. Um, I always say humble bundle. Uh, the humble bundle. Yeah, he uh, <laughs> he surprised the heck out of me when after he'd done like four or five series, all of a sudden he came back and uh, started like a you know five years later with the Strangers of Paradise characters, and all of a sudden the other characters started walking around in this universe. I was like. Way, way. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with that. The the Terry verse. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. Okay, no, I'm just I, I I can't pronounce the name, but the the um, slightly more cartoonishly drawn smaller monkey, the the earliest species. Oh, um, the Australopithecus uh, of humanity, the uh, one who has the. Yeah, yeah, early ancestor of the bones. It feels uh, like it's well, in the uh, well, early answer like of all of us, of all of us. That is the it's the yeah. First, I guess I guess there's actual science here. <laughs> there's actual science involved. I did want to draw uh, yeah. a, a cartoon character because after doing Rassel, um, where everything was, you know, real for my style, it was real. You know, cars and buildings and dumpsters yeah. and clothing. Um, I was like, yeah, I want to draw. I don't. I don't have. Never had a problem drawing humans, but I want. I needed a cartoon character in there, and I. I decided that the uh, Australopithecus afarensis uh, would be the one that would be a would be a bone kind of cartoon like drawing. So that the science is, you know, that that was the first of the hominids that walked upright on two legs. So from the waist up, mm -hmm. uh, Lucy was pretty much 
a, a, a primate, a, name, a chimpanzee. And the, from the waist down, she was a human. It's literally the missing link, mm. Lucy. Oh, is yeah. that going to get me banned? Yeah, right. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> I'm telling you, when the when the when the fundamentalists get wind of this, <laughs> it's gonna be gonna be annoying bad news for all of us. Oh, I'm um, so scared. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. All right. So Tuki's highly recommended. People check out the links in the show notes. Uh final final question for you, Jeff. And I really appreciate you being generous with your time here and, and having the conversation. One thing that I've really enjoyed as I've gone through your work is how kind of impressive and sweet your relationship is with your wife, Vijaya, this incredible partnership who is, you know, she's the business manager of, of Boneville, right? And all this stuff. And do you have, what's the one piece of advice you would have for relationships? Because you seem to have an incredible relationship in terms of work. And then all your books are dedicated to her. I'm just very impressed by this. Like, what's your, what's your tip for the, the, the couples out there? Uh, well, first of all, I, I practically worship her. I'm, I, I'm madly in love with her. But I think one of the most important things is that uh, we're absolutely equal. There's, we are equal in our private life, in our work life. Um, we, we listen to each other. Uh, we make each other laugh. Uh, but we do spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week together. And so we, ha we have our offices, at least our seats are in different places. So... Um, here in Key West, we have a we have a little we have a little place, but there's a, a cottage out back, a duplex in the back, and Vijaya sets up her office back there, and I'm up here in the front. I've got a little a little drafty table I threw in the corner here of the living room that I work on when I'm down here. So we uh, so we we had to have special separate workspaces, mostly because we we should get important phone calls and say, oh, well, he's not here right now, and then I'd find out who she was talking to, and be like, hey, hey, I'll talk to him. And she's like. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> you have to both love cartoons and you have to trust each other. Perfect. I love it. All right. That's a great, great note to go out on. All right, brother. It was love it. Really nice talking to you, man. A pleasure talking to you. I appreciate you taking the time. Very, very much appreciated. And um, this has been great. So thank you so much.